Thank you for being here. Uh, one of the virtues of, of the way we do it, or can do it, is we can become more uh, casual as opposed to, we have very formal presentation, but that doesn't mean we have to be formal in the way we talk, talk to each other or ask questions. The virtue of the panel, the virtue of this thing is you can ask questions. City staff by, by law, according to the city manager, is not allowed to give an opinion to say whether they think it's a good thing or a bad thing. They can, they can uh, answer your questions and give out facts. Uh, Mr. Cannon and Cecine both can give their opinions if they want to, but I'll bet you $10 they don't. Uh, the reason they're here, uh, Andrew and, and Mr. Cecine, is to put, it in, to put what McAllen wants to do into perspective. Uh, part of this came at a Citizens League meeting I was attending where someone asked uh, the city staffers, well, what happens if we get our, I'm paraphrasing, our water efficiently to the McAllen far line, what happens then? What about down the valley? What's their drainage systems like? I have absolutely no idea. So um, we'll, we'll get a, this is a kind of a twofer. It's a, you don't, this is a great opportunity is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Raul Sessin is the general manager of the uh, Hidalgo County um, Irrigation District. Drainage. Drainage District, I'm sorry. I knew the difference. Uh, Andrew Cannon is with the Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is, as I said, something that a lot of people don't hear about, but it's actually pretty important, very essential in how we get funding for roads and how roads are planned for. Yvette Barrera is the city, uh, city uh, engineer in McAllen, and Patricia Longoria is the, the, uh, was the interim traffic manager, but are you now? Are you still interim? Still interim, okay. Uh, so um, we're going to hear from them. And then that'll prompt questions. So write down your questions, and we'll go from there. Um, and if we if we go till eight o'clock, we'll stop then. And if it wears itself out before then, we'll all call Miller time. I shouldn't do that. We'll all go home. All right. Who wants to go first? Andrew. The tell. That, that's a giveaway right there. I'll try to stay back here. I really hate podiums. So if you can't hear me, please let me know. I just a little ADD on standing still in one spot for too long. My name is Andrew Cannon. I'm the Director of Transportation Planning for the Hidalgo County Metropolitan Planning Organization. Uh, we call it the HCMPO. Big fancy word for a federally mandated program that oversees transportation planning uh, in areas with population density greater than 200,000. For us, it's the entire county of Hidalgo. Uh, we have two sister entities in Cameron County, one in the Harlingen San Benito area, and one in Brownsville. Uh, we work on uh, the planning efforts and initiatives for federally funded and state funded transportation projects. All of those come through our offices and uh, through our board to uh, decide upon. So my perspective is going to be a little bit unique from the other uh, people at the table because I know nothing about drainage. Uh, except that hoping my yard drains off into the street when it rains really hard. That's it. That's the extent of my knowledge. So I work for a board. I have about 26 bosses. Uh, every elected official for every entity in Hidalgo County, the city and the county has an elected official that sits on my board and that's who I take transportation guidance from. Uh, Mayor uh, Ambrosia Hernandez in uh, FAR is my chairman. Joseph Palacios, County Commissioner, uh, Precinct 4 is my Vice Chairman, and David Suarez, the Mayor of uh, Westlaco, is my uh, Secretary, and then the other elected officials and law transit representatives sit on my board, and that's who we take guidance from. So as I said, we're a federally mandated program. I'm paid 100% from your nice tax dollars when you go to the fuel pump. Uh, so please uh, quit buying Priuses. And Tesla's, I'd like you all to go out and buy F-350s and Hummers. Make more trips to the pump. We need more money, more revenue. I'd really appreciate that. Uh, unless I could get everybody to just agree to let me raise your gas taxes 20 cents, then I'd really like to do that. So, uh, but at the sake of not being shot, uh, Fern shaking her head, no, I will just go with buy uh, bigger vehicles. So, uh, my office does a, a, a lot of different things. I think I have a really great staff that does a, a lot of different things good. Some of it is visualization. I just wanted to show this, be able to brag on my staff for a minute. The picture on the left is Bicentennial, uh, as it is or as it was before construction began. 
The picture on the right is an illustration that my staff created of what Bicentennial will look like when all that mayhem that you have to drive through is completed. These are part of the tools that we go out to the public with when we're talking about projects because it's a little easier to understand than a one-dimensional line on a map. Not everybody can necessarily understand, well, you're doing away with the on-ramp or whatever and overpasses. So it's just a little bit of what we do uh, to try to better illustrate projects. So some more of what we do. Our organization, through the leadership of our elected officials, we, pop, we popped uh, $2.6 million into the interstate illumination project. We're doing all of Interstate 2 within Hidalgo County and all of I-69C, all the way up north of, uh, well, just to Edinburgh. Edinburgh's done some of their own. Uh, we're not doing the part that McAllen did. McAllen actually got an energy grant, and they were way ahead of us on that curve and changed out all of theirs to LED lighting. Uh, this process is really close to being completed. Officially, the timeline is August. I would venture to say it'll be done before then. And then once it is, you'll have a really nice, well-lit expressway all the way from Brownsville to Edinburgh, all well illuminated. So it's something we've needed. We did that in cooperation with the cities and with TxDOT because in case you don't know, when freeways are built and lights are put out there, TxDOT pays for the construction and for the lights, but then it's turned over for the city to the cities to maintain and then pay the electric bill on. So some cities don't necessarily keep up with the upkeep as well. Things have happened here or there. So we worked out something to where we were able to go back and uh, put some money into that, some federal dollars, and get all that done and changed out all the lighting to LED. It'll last forever. Very low draw on the electric bill for the cities. Most importantly, a huge safety factor when traveling along the expressway. One of the biggest projects we have in the books right now, I-69 interchange. I'm sure some of you probably made it to a public meeting. It was about six months ago. Uh, we're really looking forward to move forward with this project. Uh, as you can see, the limits of the project are much greater than just the interchange. It goes west, uh, uh, just to the edge of the city of Far, east into San Juan, and then north just shy of the uh, uh, Edinburgh city limits. And this is not only to address the interchange itself and added capacity there, but also to, uh, to address some of the overpasses. Some of the overpasses need to be raised to meet the new minimum standards because trucks are getting taller, freight is getting bigger. Uh, so that's part of the project. We have $150 million on this project right now. We're hoping to be working with TxDOT to uh, secure more funding uh, for that. I'm not really certain. I don't have a let date to tell you, but we're hoping to, uh, TxDOT's going through the environmental process, which means public meetings to get your feedback to see which, you, which way you think this project would be best suited for the valley. Drainage. This is the only drainage project in 15 years almost of me doing this I've ever had on my books. Uh, we have $19 million uh, in for a project that will directly impact the construction of the new courthouse. And that is to run, uh, to do a rehab project on University Drive from 10th all the way over to, uh, I apologize, what is that? Oh, yes. Uh, all the way to McCall and uh, one of the scopes that we're looking at is the incorporation of a line there to meet the flooding needs that happen in the square area. Uh, this is a project that was secured by uh, Commissioner Blasio's uh, uh, some time ago. We are in discussions with TxDOT because the scope of this project may be changing, but the funding for it is identified and we do have it on the books right now to be able to move forward with. Because 107 North, I mean West needs a little uh, rehabilitation. 107 East towards the expressway definitely needs some rehabilitation. We have areas on the uh, roadway where the crown of the road is actually much, much higher than the curbside. Um, generally, we're used to like a 2% grade for runoff. It's much greater than that. It needs to be addressed, and it would give us an opportunity to be able to do that and meet the needs of the outfall for getting the water out of the square area as well as that courthouse project moves forward. It's not specifically for that project, but it would address some of the flooding that happens in the area when that project is underway. Um, these are our long-range plans. This is everything I have on our books in cooperation with TxDOT for the next 25 years, which is how far out we plan for. Uh, as you can see, uh, the red projects are projects that we have completed. The most important part of it are the projects that are in blue that are projects that we have no funding for. Uh, so we're not moving forward with yet. It's just these are conceptual. The important thing about our organization, which works completely different than the rest of the federal government, and I'm not really certain why, but uh, we have no projects in our plan that are not funded. 
I legally cannot put a project in there that does not have real money associated with it and identified for 25 years on our plan. Um, so we're very restricted on our budget. But as you can see, it's pretty dynamic. Some of the, I don't know if this will show up, I guess it does a little bit. Some of the projects we're a little most excited about would be this 1925 project because that would connect up here in Cameron County with the Northern Causeway. Uh, we have individuals like myself, I live in far north McAllen, so I would never go down to 100. I would simply take this route over to the new causeway to be able to access the island. Of course, the county loop, uh, we know that the RMA is moving forward with this and as well as uh, uh, some of these other projects that they, they have funded, trying to get additional funding for this project that also connects up with the Donna Bridge. Uh, this project is very important to the city of Far and to the city of Donna, more to the city of Far so that we can get trucks out from running through the middle of the city and onto an expressway facility and out. And then uh, I guess some of you may have attended, if not seen it in the paper about State Highway 68, which is the project that runs north from Interstate 2 and will eventually connect back up with I-69C. And of course, the La Jolla bypass is underway now, uh, which is an expressway facility that would move the traffic away from La Jolla north, so that way you don't have all that traffic through town during, uh, near the school zones. It's a safety issue, so that project's funded and moving forward. In a nutshell, that's everything I do. I know it was really fast. I, I like putting that out there just for giggles. Something, no, we don't have anything like that here. Uh, I, I, I grew up in Houston. That's more like Houston or maybe Austin, but uh, that's, that's something we try to avoid in our planning process, so that's for giggles. Uh, and I do have this, I know people have asked, uh, I've actually been on Davis's radio station uh, a couple of times talking about this. We are hopeful that there is a merger of the three entities all into one. It would make us the fifth largest in the state. Uh, something we need to do because we would secure a great deal of money and we're just shooting ourselves in the foot by not doing this. In fact, we're the only uh, TxDOT district in the state that has more than one MPO in the district because it's, I guess, Friday night lights type things that have been going on for decades, far longer than I've lived here. But uh, yeah, so we're hoping to tap into some of that money. And then of course, if, you, if I can ever answer any questions for you, I'm available besides tonight to be able to do so. With that, that's, that's all I have, Davis. Can you put that back up? Oh, yeah. Wait a minute, the county. That one? Yeah. Oh. It was so dark without it, that's all. Oh, well, Raul, I'm reading Raul, it, it's just it's, it's a light source. All right, if that prompted questions, like I have one about the second causeway, but I'm going to hold that question until the question time. We also want to um, acknowledge to, um, to uh, I said county commissioners, to uh, city commissioners, we have Omar Quintanilla, who represents the district. I don't know if this is your district or not. No, it's three. Is this your district? No. Um, this is JJ's district, JJ Samora. This is his district. Um, they're here to watch. Um, I doubt they're here to keep the city staff in line, but I mean, I don't really know what goes on behind closed doors. All right, so that's the, that's the larger street picture. One of the things I hope Patricia will address is because I've heard the mayor say it at least once in me city meetings is, uh, what about east-west traffic? How do we get east-west traffic moving faster? I thought that was a great idea. Um, if we are efficient in getting our drainage out of our neighborhoods um, and somewhere else, and we're not gonna dump them in far and every place else, uh, how are they gonna hook into the countywide system? And so Raul says, seen is here, and he, this is his purview, this is his bailiwick. And I'm making a big assumption that our drainage, drainage uh, operation connects with their drainage operation. We'll find out.
Oh, but what's no, I can't think of it. Right here. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Hyman. <laughs> That's all we have to worry about, right? Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Raul Cecina. As mentioned, I'm the general manager for uh, Dow County Drain District Number One. So, um, our job basically is to uh, to manage all the water. Uh, that comes uh, from the cities and the rural areas and, and, and manage it, control it, and take it out uh, to the ultimate outfall. In some cases, Laguna Madre, and in other cases, uh, the IBWC floodway or the river. So in our presentation mainly today is focused some on our, on our operations and mainly on some of the projects that we have identified as uh, 2012 bond projects uh, that directly impact uh, the city of McAllen and some of the improvements. I'm not very familiar with the 22 million uh, bond projects uh, as far as location and everything. So my presentation is just general and then obviously we can answer some questions. There are many outfalls that uh, currently McAllen uh, discharges into. We will cover one of them, uh, two of them, excuse me, in detail uh, that are bond projects that are being improved and so forth that do help uh, the southern part and southeastern part of McAllen uh, and also some of the northern part as well. Um, I guess. I, we have uh, three projects also the northern part so um, can you tell by the color of the slide where I went uh, you know we got a lot of Aggies and uh, a lot of Longhorns here but I'm a Crimson Tide man myself so roll tide anyway so uh, our drainage district uh, we we currently have 584 miles that we maintain uh, at the district and out of that we have uh, 328 uh, that we have um, through interlocals and 256 that, that we own. Uh, we, we enter into a lot of agreements interlocals with uh, a lot of the uh, local irrigation districts. As you know, uh, or you may not know, a lot of the system that's in place was originally created for irrigation land. Uh, so uh, we've expanded on that and we've been working on that. We'll talk a little bit about that, but we do, uh, we do uh, continue to seek uh, ir uh, in locals with various irrigation districts so we can continue to improve drainage in, 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 in the county. Um, we, we, our ultimate goal is to continue to expand our system, not only our existing system that we currently have, but also whatever in locals we enter into uh, to account for all the growth that our county has experienced in the last uh, 20 years. Um, our district boundary, it's approximately um, 800 square miles. Uh, a lot of people believe that the district boundary encompasses the whole county of Hidalgo, which it does not. Uh, it does uh, go to the eastern portion of the county with Cameron and in the border uh, with Mexico and the river, but it goes western uh, approximately on Iowa Road in that area, and then north, it, it just kind of zigzags around 490. When it gets to 281, it, it meanders around uh, uh, 2812 and, uh, and then ties back into the county line over there. So uh, we have currently, uh, 51 2012 bond projects um, and uh, 22 have been completed. In 2012 there was a bond that was passed uh, by the voters of the county and out of that there were 25 items that were identified in the bond. Um, 22 uh, of those items were project specific meaning there were uh, the, the funds were going to be allocated specifically for those 22 projects and then there were three general projects. Uh, one of them was uh, rural drainage development uh, monies was allocated for rural drainage development to improve drainage in the rural area. Others with, uh, as where another item was for system acquisition to acquire some facilities that the county had constructed. 
and the last one was for weirs, various weirs that we improved. So uh, even though we had 25, we actually have 51 because of those three that, that have uh, spur into uh, many projects uh, that we've done uh, countywide. So, and out of that, we have 46 non-bond projects that we're working on right now. And as it says, the, the list keep, keeps growing. You know, we keep adding, adding work through, through partnerships with the, have with the municipalities, partnerships we have with, uh, with the irrigation district and so forth, as I mentioned. So we keep uh, working to, uh, to improve drainage in our county by taking uh, 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 drainage to areas that, that currently don't have any. So um, we have 23 administrative positions, 154 maintenance and operation positions, and, and this is our, our staff here. Out of that, um, I'm a licensed engineer. Uh, it's the first one that has been at the district, uh, running the, the district. I've been there for three years now. And uh, currently, I have three other licensed engineers with me uh, that work there with me. And then we have two EITs as well. Uh, so uh, we've stepped up with some uh, you know, engineers. That obviously, for the drainage district, you need to have an understanding of, of water and drainage and so forth. So uh, we've done that in the last three years. Uh, one day, we hope to be as big as McAllen and have as many engineers as they do. So I, I think they have like 20 or something. I don't know, something like that. So <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, this is just our county map, as I was mentioning. You know, their county line, uh, the county line runs all the way, and you, you don't see it all the way to the north. But this is basically our boundary, that yellow that you see there. So it doesn't really encompass the whole county. Under the water code, we're able to uh, take any improvements or take any water that comes from the watershed into our area and manage it. So that's how a lot of the projects, uh, a lot of the natural flow that comes from the, from the north and the west, Everything naturally flows uh, basically southeasterly uh, from, from, from west, to, west to east, as you know, all the way through Cameron and Willisey County. Um, we, uh, we have a, a natural ridge that exists basically uh, around the uh, 495 area or so, and they call it the Mission Ridge, and that starts over here on the west, and it comes all the way through uh, right here by the, by the floodway. So any water that's, that's actually south of that ridge uh, goes into the IBWC floodway. Uh, and you see the floodway right here. And for those that don't know, the IBWC floodway is actually the, the, uh, the floodway that is used during uh, heavy rain events when the, the river water needs to be diverted. Uh, I don't know if you recall, we had that diversion here recently. So uh, that's what that floodway does. It's, it, it, water is diverted from the river so it can be managed downstream so we don't flood uh, Cameron County. And it does come through here and it parallels our channel and comes out here into the Laguna Madre. So that's what that floodway serves, but it also serves that outfalls for a lot of our ditches, uh, both that flow from north to south and some that flow from south to north into the floodway itself. And then on the eastern part of the county as well, we have a lot of our systems that flow into that floodway, but we do have a lot of systems, some that, are, that flow through McAllen and so forth, that get into our, our north system, our north channel, which eventually end up into our North Florida water channel that does go out into the Laguna Madre as well. So it's a, it's, it's a very intricate system that we have. Um, if you can see a lot of these highlighted um, or light blue uh, ditches that are identified here are actual ditches that we have through interlocals, the light blue ones with, with the irrigation districts. Um, so as we continue to, uh, to improve drainage in the rural area, uh, we continue to enter into more interlocals to, to be able to to provide better, better drainage out there. Um, <clears throat> like as I mentioned today, I was gonna to talk about the, the 2012 bond projects and the, and the projects that, uh, that identify, I guess, are, are with uh, the, the area of McAllen and Rainville Drain, our J09 drain system, the Mission uh, Recertification, the Mission Lateral, Radio Drain Reroute, South Harbor McAllen Lateral, and then just a maintenance operation project was a J08 drain. By the way, that's our Panchita structure right there. That's the structure uh, that right before it enters into Willis County that, that, that manages the water uh, downstream uh, in our flood water, main flood water channel. <clears throat> the Rainville Drain. Uh, this is an approved uh, project um, by the uh, WARDA, which is Water Resource Development Act. Um, it, it, it is a project uh, that uh, we've been uh, working on for close to 18 years now, when it was first originally uh, identified as a, as a project. And 
the district took over the project. It was first with the federal government through uh, Army Corps of Engineers, and then we took over. So we've been managing the project now. And uh, you know, the main components of it is going to have regional stormwater management. All the water, as I mentioned, goes east and goes through Willacy County. So the rainbow drain is an existing system in, uh, as part of the uh, Delta Lake uh, irrigation system. And uh, that part of that system will be improved uh, to manage all the waters that are coming here from our area. It's about approximately 63 miles. Uh, it's also going to have environmental mitigation and preservation opportunities because our system is currently flowing. And you see our system, even during dry periods, we have a couple of two to three feet of water from groundwater and from irrigation uh, facilities that, uh, you know, that are watering the, uh, for crops and so forth. Those, those get into our system. So it's constantly a wet. So uh, we're able to, to use that uh, also for that purpose. Um, Protection and provision of economic development estimated about $40 billion in, uh, in growth taxable assets uh, that this, this project can, can manage or uh, have a positive impact. Our, our proposed uh, right of way is 350 feet, and this is just a channel section that we have right now, um, estimated $400 million. Right now we're, in the pro we're actually uh, in under construction right here. Uh, this is segment one. The Ramil Drain, which is going to connect uh, the community of Fayesville into our, our North Main uh, system. But once this system is developed completely, and this is it right here, this is the bypass right here at the Edinburgh Lake. So these, these laterals that come right now, they come uh, from, from McAllen and so forth, Edinburgh, uh, some even as far as Mission, and all come through here through our, this is our North Florida Water Channel. There'll be a bypass here. So once this, this channel is in place, there'll be um, an tremendous, uh, a tremendous amount of uh, capacity that will be able to be diverted, which in essence will provide better relief for uh, areas, as I mentioned. But also the, the eastern part of the county will benefit because those waters will not stack as much as they do now when we start bypassing water. So it's a very important regional project uh, for our county. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next project is the J09 drain. It's uh, it's located about approximately one mile north of 1925 uh, from uh, Bryan Road all the way to a uh, quarter mile east of Jackson Road where our North Main runs north and south there. Um, phase one and two, um, phase one has been completed at west side of Wallace and then phase two has also been completed uh, part of the section from our outfall west across to uh, uh, Organic Care Drive, which is McCall, I guess. And uh, phase three right now, we're in the process of acquiring uh, two parcels, but we also have it out for bid. Um, so this, this drain is uh, uh, scheduled to be completed at the end of this year. Uh, we're, we're aggressively excavating it and pursuing it. So uh, estimated right now is 8.7 million. This is the, basically the, the location of this drain here. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. We have the Mission Inlet recertification. The Mission Inlet uh, originally was uh, the bypass for the river before uh, uh, before the uh, the Banker floodway or before the floodway was constructed, IBWC floodway. So uh, before uh, that's how they would, they would bypass uh, waters uh, or needed to divert waters was through the Mission Inlet. That no longer is the case. So this this system actually is, a, is an important system for McAllen, southern part of McAllen. Uh, southern part of Mission and a little, a little southwest part of Far. Uh, it serves that area there. So right now we're in the process of we've done all the evaluations, hydraulics and everything, and uh, we're looking at adding just east of Jackson where it currently enters the IBWC floodway, uh, some control boxes and so forth. Uh, the idea here is because it is, it's, it, originally it's a levee system, um, but no longer in use. We've evaluated and determined the area that we need within the channel to contain a 100-year event. And then the rest of it, our uh, objective is also to take it uh, out of the, the flood zone and make it, excuse me, into developable property. So we were estimating about uh, 670 acres uh, west of, uh, of, of Cimarron that could be taken out. And then with some improvements with the boxes uh, and some channel improvements and so forth, Initial 830 acres could be taken out, so a uh, combination of about 1,500 acres that could be released back um, for the tax rolls, for improvements, and so forth. So, and we're working with McAllen, actually, Mr. Uh, the Carlos Gonzalez, uh, the 
PUB engineer has reached out to us because they're, McAllen's interested since it's a, could be a water feature uh, on the southern part of, of McAllen and so forth. So uh, working with McAllen, the cost for that project is 14 million. This is it right here. As I mentioned, it serves uh, Mission, South Mission. All this is South McAllen. Um, and you've got the airport right here. And then part of uh, when it crosses Jackson Road, you've got uh, the southwest part of FAR that it serves as well. So, And this system, as I mentioned, um, once this uh, letter map revision based on, on field is, is issued uh, by FEMA, we'll be able to start releasing some of those properties. And it's just an aerial picture of, of the drain current condition. Uh, the mission lateral, this was a small project that I identified uh, on the bond. Uh, you know, originally um, the, the plan was to extend a 10 by 10 box that existed there, that exists there. Um, we went out for bids, uh, came in over budget. So what I did, now that we have, we have in-house engineering, I said, well, let's reevaluate and see what the real need is. Because as I mentioned, our system is primarily agricultural. And um, we don't have the capacity, uh, you know, to dump too much water. We have to regulate and manage the water as it moves downstream. So we evaluated for a 25-year event, and we determined that based on, on, on that evaluation that uh, no work is needed at this time. And, and that being because uh, the issue here is not really uh, at this intersection at Benson, uh, the problem that, that we're having is, well, you don't see it here, but it's at Conway. And the idea was to try to improve this, to try to improve the Conway, but we've determined that the Conway crossing is really what we need to focus on to improve better water flow. So, uh, so that's, that's, uh, this project is, is basically uh, not, uh, not needed, in our opinion, for the 25-year for the event. Uh, the uh, rate of drain reroute, this is a project that we have uh, 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 multiple uh, twin 114 aluminized type 2 asphalt coated uh, concrete line uh, CMP pipe uh, between Uvalde and uh, what's the road? Uh, I believe mean Colbath on the south side of uh, right Uvalde and Colbath. Um, we uh, that's the, our radio drain. Uh, the system actually that you just saw before here. This system right here uh, is our mission lateral, and this is our McAllen mission system. From here, the water actually goes north, and from here it goes south. And this goes into the WDC floodway eventually, and this goes north, meanders north, and eventually gets into our, uh, our North Flow Water Channel over there by the Rainbow Drain that I mentioned. So um, the work that we're looking at is down here south of 83. Um, we, uh, we had some issues with the, with, the, with the pipe. There were some connections that were done that weakened the, the, the backfill, uh, the, the fine silts that were around the pipe. It started eroding away. I think McAllen had an issue with uh, one of the roads. I think uh, there was an issue. I don't know if it was a full collapse, or there were some issues there. So um, we, we put that as a bond issuance, got an evaluation, um, went through different options. and. The option that, that we had to use because of the confined area that we had to work with regarding some residents that were in the area and so forth it didn't allow us to do a traditional method of just opening and removing and setting boxes. Uh, we had to do a, uh, a slip line type of system uh, and the uh, cost for that project actually came in at 5.6 million. And that project's been fully completed so and, and that's in location right there. This is what it looks like right now. So, the confined area right here that we had to work with, and there wasn't just enough physical space. Uh, there was a lot of erosion that had taken place here as well. And there was concern that you know we could have issues up here as well in this, so we had to slip line those uh, those barrel pipes. The South McCallan, uh, excuse me, South Far McCallan lateral. This is a, a lateral that it's about four and a half miles that runs southeasterly and it serves both. Uh, uh, McAllen and Far. There's a split there at 83 uh, where waters from, uh, I guess, uh, central east of McAllen comes in and also from Far and it crosses and meanders southeasterly direction and gets up at the IBWC floodway. Currently we have a, uh, a project, we have a project at the floodway where we're adding boxes uh, to increase the gravity flow into the system 
and we're also putting uh, staging areas for pumps. Uh, we're doing that on all our floodway projects. So this is one of several that we have ongoing where we're increasing the capacity during a rain event, but when we have to sh close the gates because of the uh, of the, the floodway being full where they divert river water, we have to be pumping water over it. So we're setting uh, staging areas so we can bring in portable pumps and continue to move water over the levee uh, when the gates get closed. Uh, right now it's under construction. It's about 50% complete, and that's a $1.049 million project. So This is where uh, it originates the drain, and this is where the work is being done. Uh, there's a McAllen drain that goes this way, and there's a far drain that comes here. So there's a split there of water that comes in uh, from McAllen and far, though. Well, Las Tiendas Mall in that area, I think uh, if you drive by there, you'll see it. <clears throat> the JO8 Dream, this uh, is a project that, that's located just south of Monte Cristo. It actually originates east of McCall, and it travels westerly all the way uh, currently to Ware Road, but eventually it'll extend all the way west uh, to uh, Conway. Um, uh, this system you know, serves a lot of the area, the current area that's, that, that I mentioned, but also is an important outfall for the, uh, the Tres Lagos development that's happening in McAllen right now. Uh, AMM school and then all the growth that's going on in that area, this system's gonna manage that water. We've already improved some of that, uh, some of that area east of there with some uh, bench systems that we, we like to do because it, it not only uh, uh, allows for more water to, uh, to be accommodated in the system, but also facilitates maintenance for long term. So it's a good maintenance and operation uh, projects that we, that we like doing at the district. Um, uh, project's about 98% complete, and we just got some uh, concrete rip and stuff at the ends to, to work on, so basically this is it right here. This is our main McCall, and it goes all the way west to where road, and this is what their La Tres Lagos development is happening right now. <clears throat> uh, and that's just a picture there. Uh, <clears throat> maintenance and operation projects in general. Uh, you know, we continue to improve drainage in our, in our county, uh, adopting set division requirements uh, that require additional detention. Obviously, it's more rooftop streets get put in. We want to make sure the water is managed. McAllen's real good. A lot of the cities, uh, even though um, they, uh, even though the district manages, or we manage the whole county, we still have to tell the cities you have to manage your water and you have to keep it, hold it, and release it at the existing rate, what it would be without any improvements. And McAllen has been real good about requiring detention facilities and improvements to make sure they manage the water, they don't dump it downstream. It doesn't all end up downstream and affecting everybody else. And all the other cities are also uh, are doing that. We, uh, we're doing that. Uh, we're improving, as I mentioned, our requirements. And, uh, and we actively uh, are also improving the drainage by taking the existing drainage ditches that we have and, and creating a bench system that allow for an efficient way to, uh, for maintenance uh, while creating more volume in the system. So, you know, we take existing systems and you can see the bench here. Uh, and this ditch, I, as a matter of fact, is this one that we finished here. Uh, we partnered with the school district in this case. So we get an easement from them. This ditch was basically something like this, what you see next to the road. It was like this here. We partnered with the school district uh, because during Dolly, this, all this was underwater. So we, we partnered with them. Uh, we were able to go in there and, and, and move the ditch, which is a big safety. We addressed a big safety issue. Uh, not only did we move it, we created a, probably uh, double the volume in the system. Uh, so these type of maintenance and operation projects in the long run will help us be more efficient in our maintenance because instead of having big equipment to have to clean it when it's just a typical V-shaped ditch, uh, when we have these benches like this, we can get our shredders in place run with them and, and continue to. Uh, this is one that we're working currently right now. Uh, if you go out there now in Curry, actually most of this work is already done uh, from uh, Alamo Road, quarter mile west, Alamo Road all the way to Sharp, but we're continuing all the way uh, about half a mile east of Sharp. So that's under construction now. And again, in this system, we're probably doubling capacity as well. This is one of the areas that got hit heavy during Hurricane Dolly. So that's, you know, that's one of the ways that we're we're trying to work within our existing right of way to, to uh, facilitate maintenance, but at the same time create more volume. So <clears throat> I think McAllen does a lot of that in, in their system. They did a lot of that work as well, but they, they did more of a flat slope type of excavate a lot of the areas. So 
And then last, uh, report legal dumping. Um, you know, a lot of people say, hey, you know, uh, I don't know uh, why we're flooding. You know, we're having issues. This is a real case here. We had a subdivision uh, where we kept on complaining, well, we're flooding, we're flooding, you know, a uh, little bit of rain, two inch rain, and we flood. So uh, through the precinct, the precinct asked for assistance, and we said, sure, let's go, the, you know, let's go look at it. The drain ditch is right here. Uh, traditionally, the district doesn't work inside the subdivision. That's really the, the, the responsibility of the precincts, but, but we are there to help. So we went. Uh, and, and pulled out, as you can see, this, this pipe is all full of debris. Trash, everything. Um, you can see here there's a, a mattress, you know, one of our systems. Uh, you can see here, I don't know, probably 40, 50 bags of trash. Here, and then obviously this is after an event, uh, everything floating to, to the pipe. So, you know, it's very important we always uh, uh, promote, hey, report legal dumping. You know, it may not be, uh, you, you know, it's not something that, that that is that important, I guess, at, at times when it's dry, but when it's wet like this, you can see what could happen, you know, and, and that's, that's really contributes to a lot of the flooding issues that we have, so. Uh, thank you, any, any questions? I guess we'll take questions after. Oh, I, I, I'd like to acknowledge that we do have our commissioner-elect, uh, Ms. Torres here, so, from Precinct wow. 4. She's part of the, I think she has part of North McAllen as well, so. We want to get your home phone and personal cell, uh, too, just, you know, just in case. Uh, I can say one of my fondest memories was the late 60s, I think, at the Cotton Bowl, January the 1st, when that was still a big deal. Oh, well, you're an Aggie, Yvette, unless you lied on your resume. Your class, A&M, she's an A&M engineer. Yeah, I remember when, when the Aggies beat the only time, I guess it was, Alabama. And, all right, enough of that, enough of that. All right, so now you got the overview. Um, the question I want, or yeah, the question I want, uh, well, I think Yvette should address is how does this project, what does it have to do with that? Um, and I think I'm also right in saying this, these schematics in some cases go back more than 100 years when the drainage districts were first put in and the irrigation districts were first put in. This was stuff was all done. I was told that the, the ridge, that the railroad track along Old 83 is on a high point. The, the railroad knew that back 100 years ago. Um, and maybe you can also talk about uh, impervious, pervious and impervious surfaces. There's a little touch of Austin for you and how that fits into the drainage plans. Uh, Yvette Barrera is the city engineer, one of the many, many, many engineers they have at the city of McAllen. Uh, yes, exactly. And uh, I was told for some reason the, the city just loves engineers, licensed engineers. She also is for a short period of time director of traffic operations. So um, you'll get more questions. I've got your questions in my pocket. Keep on writing them out and we'll, we'll get to the, to the fun part later on, the funner part. Yes. Yes, ma'am, I'm ready. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to stand near the podium or else you won't be able to hear me speak. So um, try and stand as close to the mic. Can everybody hear me in the back? Just want to make sure. All right, very good. So um, I know Davis, well, first I'd like to touch upon the subject of our many engineers in our engineering department. <laughs> I'm the director of the engineering department. We actually have six licensed engineers in our office. That's all. We don't have 20. We have one licensed engineer, although we do the work of 20. We have one licensed engineer in our traffic operations division as well. And so um, I'm here to present information regarding a proposed bond for 2018. I know Davis had um, asked some additional questions. Um, we have actually a, a prepared presentation and um, maybe to touch on some of the issues that, that he brought up, we could do that after the, the presentation during the, the question and answer period. Um, 
more specifically, we're here to address uh, the two propositions um, that are in the bond, Proposition A for drainage improvements, which I will discuss, and Proposition B for traffic operations, which uh, Patricia will discuss. Uh, that is a Spanish version, just to remind all um, our participants that we have the presentation online on our McAllen website um, in Spanish as well. So if there's um, any family members or any friends that, that are Spanish speakers, um, you can encourage them to visit the website. The presentation is translated um, on the website. So to start off with, um, in 2015, the city of McAllen uh, conducted a citizen survey, actually uh, hired um, a company called ETC, ETC to conduct that, ETC Institute to conduct that survey. As a result of that survey, I'm sorry, I keep moving this computer. As a result of that survey, um, our residents indicated that there were some issues that, that they would like to see addressed. And two of those issues um, were related, one was related to traffic and the other was related to drainage. And so our city commission said based, you know, based upon the survey, they wanted the staff to put together some action plans so we can address these uh, two uh, major issues that, are, that our citizens um, were looking at. So the first one um, is drainage. So staff went back, took a look at um, our master drainage uh, plan that was uh, last updated in 2008. We took that plan, we uh, met with our public works department, our traffic operations division, sat down and looked at what are the areas that our staff is going out there and addressing, where are they having to close down roadways, where are they having to install pumps, what are the issues that the staff is facing. We went back and took an inventory of calls that we received from our citizens um, for regarding uh, traffic, sorry, drainage related issues. We compiled that list and develop uh, cost estimates for those projects. We also uh, develop criteria to analyze um, and set priorities to each of those projects. Was there water actually getting into the homes? Was the water just uh, maintained in the roadway? So um, using that criteria, we developed a ranking system for those projects and updated our uh, storm drainage master plan. We also conducted an inventory of our drainage system so that we can uh, better use um, the infrastructure that we have in place. We're also um, working on our plans, continue to work on them, um, to replace aging infrastructure, to study areas that are recently annexed, and to develop a stormwater quality monitoring ordinance. On the traffic side, we were looking at how can we improve uh, mobility within the city. And particularly, we were focusing on our signals and how to improve signal coordination. And so we're looking at installing new traffic controllers, uh, doing signal detention, detection that goes beyond what we normally do, uh, completing a uh, congestion management study and um, improving on our traffic uh, control center, actually creating a live traffic control center. And then also looking at what, what are the um, intersection improvements that we can propose and move forward with. So um, in order to do and put these action plans into place, we need funding. So we went back and looked at what are our current funding sources, what funds do we have available, who are we lacking in funds, and how can we um, pay for these improvements. Uh, using our uh, city's capital improvement funds based on the rates that we have funded projects in previous years, uh, we estimate that it would take approximately 60 years to complete these projects using those existing funding sources. And part of that is because our funding sources have decreased over the years. Uh, in the past, we received several million dollars from gas royalties, three, four, five million dollars a year on those gas royalties. Those are down to um, in the range of 100 to 300,000 a year now. And so we have several revenue sources similar to the gas royalties that have decreased. So we can't go with the same pay-as-you-go system that the city had implemented in the past, and we need to look at um, what are those additional funding sources that we can pursue in order to get projects completed. So what's being proposed? Um, let's take a little bit uh, more detailed look into the drainage portion for Proposition A. So between 2006 and 2009, um, I would like to say that the city has not just um, been sitting idly and not working on projects. We have been implementing drainage improvements. In that period, we completed approximately $1.92 million of drainage um, infrastructure. That basically shows the area of those projects. Through 2011, we added 3.73 million for a total of uh, 5.65 million of drainage infrastructure. Through 2014, we added another 8.28 million. 
And through 2018, we added an additional 1.71 million for a total of $15.64 million of drainage improvement projects from 2006 to 2018. Uh, there were other funding sources besides the CIP program. Um, went back and looked at how much of our CIP uh, funding sources were actually allocated to this. It comes out at an average of approximately $350,000 per, $350, per year, which is where we got the time frame estimate for the 60 years to complete the projects. So when we're looking at this and we're uh, proposing the projects for the bond, we're looking at $22 million worth of improvements for 23 projects and those are identified in red. This is the list of the projects, and I would encourage you to go to, the, to our website and you can get a, um, be able to see these projects in more detail, and if you have any questions, you can contact my office, and we can provide you additional information on specific projects or specific areas. Again, there's 23 projects um, valued at $22 million worth of improvements. Um, as I stated, uh, when, we back, when we went back to look at our master uh, drainage plan, we um, determined not just a need for the bond, but an overall need for the city. And that includes approximately $48.9 million worth of drainage improvements, the bond being one of the sources um, for approximately the 22 million that I mentioned. So what were the other sources that we're looking at to complete the $48.9 million worth of improvements? We're looking to use one of our traditional, which is a CIP, approximately $2 million. Uh, we're also looking through CDBG, Community Development Block Grants, approximately one and a half million dollars. Um, unfortunately, those funds can only be used um, on in, in low income based areas. So we're limited to the area that those can cover. Um, our staff has also applied and received for grants through the Hazard Mitigation Grant pro Program. We have um, been awarded $5.2 million, $5 million worth of grants. Um, and those grants basically become available any time a federal disaster is, de is declared in Texas. It opens up funds on a competitive basis to all cities and, and counties, local governments in Texas, um, on a competitive basis, even though McAllen does not flood, we can still apply for those grants, which is what my staff has been doing. And we have been successful in receiving, uh, as I mentioned, 5.2 million, and we received a notice. Um, we have two more applications out there right now notice that we were receiving another approximately million dollars um, to be able to one of our projects on our master plan to be able to fund one of those projects as well um, the city also uh, developed a TERS it's a TERS 2 and it's an area that's basically along the expressway near the convention center um, towards the mall area and so what that TERS does it sets up the area so that the incremental increase in the tax rate when the area develops those properties are required to pay taxes anyway but they set aside that increase in tax from the base value um, to the, the new value, and they apply it strictly for drainage projects. And so we've identified that we will be able to set aside $6.8 million um, from that area. The city has also implemented a stormwater utility fee where we anticipate we'll receive approximately $11.2 million worth of improvements over an eight-year time frame. And then lastly, we have the bond, which we're looking uh, or we're proposing for 22 million for those projects that we had identified. I'm gonna turn it over to Patricia and she's going to review the traffic operations portion. Good evening, I'm Patricia Longoria. I'm the interim director for the traffic operations department. So I'll be speaking on the traffic improvement portion of the bond. The city of McAllen currently has 208 signals throughout the city. And um, those, are free, those are working freely or they're coordinated. We have 11 corridors that we're working towards coordinating. Our major north and south are, of course, McCall Road, 2nd Street, 10th Street, Bicentennial Boulevard, 23rd Street, and Ware Road. Davis will be happy to know that we're also gonna to try to address the east and west corridors, which are Trenton Road, Dove Avenue, Nolana Avenue, Pecan Boulevard, and Business 83. About two years ago, the city uh, purchased a central traffic management system called Centrax. The Centrax has two benefits. It gives us a real-time monitoring of signal equipment. So the way it works now is if a signal is malfunctioning or we're not having proper detection at the signal, we wait until the citizens call us, or the police department will call us if it's flashing. 
And so then the, we, they'll notify our staff. Our staff will go out there and, and troubleshoot the signal or signal cabinet or try to figure out what's going on. That, that, tech, will, that tech will return to the office, load up the, the necessary equipment, and then go address the problem. It takes a little while. What's really cool about this Centrax is once it's connected to, um, once, once we have communications with that signal, it'll give us a real-time uh, notification of what's going on, whether it's the detection or whether it's the controller, if there was a short. It'll tell us what's going on, so the tech will, will address the signal at the first, at first visit. It'll, it'll, um, it'll become more efficient. The second benefit of Centrax, it'll also give us a remote, um, we'll be able to address the coordination remotely. We'll be able to look at it from, from, the, central, from the central management uh, center and we'll be able to adjust timing. We're also, um, as we connect um, our signals to the fiber communications, we're also installing cameras and uh, with, with the police department. And so this will also give us an opportunity to watch the traffic and see whether um, there was some event in the area that may have caused congestion or if our traffic signals are, are working great or if there's a little bit of adjustment that we can do, which can also be done remotely with this with the system. So to get our signals talking to Centrax, we need to, we need to do some upgrades. So some of our infrastructure is 20 or more years old. So we're trying to get them connected to, um, to fiber, which is what will give us our communication. So we're upgrading to these new controllers with their cobalt controllers, and they give us the opportunity to connect to, um, to fiber. Once we have everything connected, or at the same time as we're trying to get everything connected, we're also wanting to um, conduct a comprehensive traffic study. So to, to, um, the traffic, this traffic study has two parts. The first part, of course, is the data collection. We'll get existing geometry of the roadways, we'll uh, get existing roadway volumes, turning movement counts, the timings, and the posted speed limits. You would think that the posted speed limits don't change that often. Within the last five years, we have, done, um, so we have worked on several inter, uh, corridors where we have changed the, the posted speed limits. The second part, part of the comprehensive study uh, will be the building of a model. We'll take all the streets in the city of McAllen and we'll build a model um, that will, will contain all this information. So this model will allow us to um, work towards progression and not only just in one direction, which, which mostly is what we have been doing recently or in the past is focusing on northwest, we'll be able to add in our, our um, east-west as well. The MPO recently did a congestion management study where they did several corridors and connected us to the, um, th they'll be connecting us to the surrounding cities. So we'll be able to build on the model that the MPO has already built and so we'll be able to address all of McAllen streets, not just the, the, the ones on system. Were the city to do this on their own, who use city staff to do this, um, it would take us about three years. A, a good comprehensive study or a good timing plan or update of a timing plan should be done every three years. So by the time we finish getting the counts and turning movement counts and existing volumes, we'd have to start all over again. So um, having a consultant do it, they can, they can focus all their resources on doing so and we could get that information from them in a timely manner. So we're talking about communications. About 10 years ago, the IT department and the traffic division began to install fiber throughout the city. The initial goal of, of this fiber was to connect all of the city facilities and get communications to them. So the libraries, city hall, everybody's connected um, to our central servers. So um, the city at some point started to take it, to, to notice that we could take advantage of all of this infrastructure. And we started to take that parks. Um, now we're connecting bus shelters we have lift stations connected to our, our um, fiber, and now we're wanting to connect all of our signals. As, and we also have PD cameras. So this is kind of what our network looks like right now. The blue is all the existing, all the existing fibers. Like I said, it, our first focus was connecting city facilities. And now um, we're trying to connect all the signals that you find on an existing route connected to, connected to the fiber, and then everything that you see in red, we're proposing 
so that we can connect the rest of our signals. But like I said, um, we are trying to take advantage of these of this infrastructure, not only install or invest just for signal connection. We're also getting PD cameras and connecting lift stations and, and so on and so forth. This is our central traffic management center. It's a little one. It's not that big, but this is where all the magic will happen. Once we've, get, well, once we've gotten our comprehensive study and our, and our model put together, we'll have staff, uh, staff will be able to monitor what's going on in real time um, in traffic, and then we'll be able to make the, the proper adjustments. So Proposition B is the traffic improvements that comes to $3 million. Cabinets and controllers are $1.3 million. The fiber is uh, $1 million. What's really cool about the fiber is because we are partnering with other entities within the city, m mainly uh, transit, we're able to um, they're able to help us with the infrastructure. So we're leveraging, uh, we're doing an 80-20 match. So we, we come up with 20% uh, and transit will pay for the other 80%. So we're able to really capitalize on our investment. And of course, uh, the engineering is the $750,000. So to recap, Proposition A is $2 million. It will address 23 drainage projects. Proposition B is $3 million, and it will address signal equipment upgrades, communications, and a comprehensive traffic study. So what will this cost you were both prop propositions to pass? It's $2 a month, uh, which comes to $24 a year for an average home value of $128,000. Early voting starts April 23rd, and it will run to May 1st. Election day is May 5th. And you can get more information on our uh, website, which is www.mcallen.net forward slash bond 2018. Thank you. And the web, website's easy to navigate. I, was, I realized I didn't have a list of the uh, coming attractions because the, they're going to do this more times. Um, I think we're the only non-city group that I know of that's doing this. The rest are, no. Never mind. There are other people doing this too, um, apparently. But um, next Monday at the Palm View Community Center, uh, there'll be an event like this starting at 5.30. Tuesday, back here at 5.30. Uh, April the 18th. Wrong. <clears throat> Pardon me, April the 18th, Wednesday, we'll be at the Lark Community Center. And then on uh, Thursday, April the 26th, 5.30 at the Tres Lagos Community Center. Okay, we've heard, I think the, the table has been set. The question I occurred to me was how it, it only costs us X number of dollars, $2 a month. Now, how are they going to pay this back? Is this, they're going to raise our taxes um, or what? Okay, yes. All your mics are hot, so you can just <laughs> participate as you. Yes, so, so a bond is an increase in your taxes, so it's paid with your uh, annual tax bill, property tax bill. It's based on the property value of your, of your business okay. home. So what do we, and what do we pay now? I don't. I'll have, I'll have to get back with you on, on that uh, rate. Do you know when that would start? Would be, this is 2018, so if it passes May the 5th, goes into this, effect immediately and you will pay it, that thing. It doesn't go into effect immediately. The city would need to first sell the bonds um, or go through the process of, of selling those bonds. Okay. And after that, that process is approved, it would um, be implemented. Another question about this. If the bond issue is passed, how will it affect seniors' tax exemption? Is there a lawyer in the house? So um, as far as the exempt, and I'm most likely going to have to get back with you on that it one. It shouldn't affect But as, as I understand, you know, um, it's based on, the, on your value or your assessed value, yeah. so it's, it comes from that value. Okay. All right. That's, we'll uh, spare Yvette for a little bit and come back to you in just... Yeah, the values are capped if you're exempt. It, it shouldn't affect it at all. But if we hear the question here, you're going to hear it at the other presentations. For Mr. Sassine, uh, I guess, and perhaps even Yvette, are we prepared, are we prepared for a major hurricane with these drainage projects that you've outlined and with the ones anticipated by the city of McAllen? 
at North to San Antonio. No. Uh, <laughs> um, we believe in the last three years we've really invested uh, at the district, and in, in, as I mentioned, our, we, we focus mainly on areas that uh, we know we had issues, um, started widening ditches, improving ditches. Definitely with the, those improvements, coupled with new systems that we've, uh, we've put in and uh, the partnerships that we are creating with the irrigation districts and improving those systems, we're definitely in a better position. Um, but it's difficult. We're flat. Our system originally was uh, created for a irrigation system, uh, a, a agricultural system. So we get something like Harvey, everybody says, hey, you know, can we sustain that? No, uh, no one can sustain that. Um, you know, our system, to put it in perspective, uh, it's, it's for a 10-year event. A, a, a hurricane is a 100-year event, right? So it's, it's all a probability. 10-year event is 10% chance of it happening. So you're going to get a lot more, you get more frequent rains, right? 10% usually get it more often. Uh, a 1% chance. You know, it's a very minute chance you'll get it, but you, you could, especially those hurricane waters. We, we experienced those type of waters in 2015. Northern McAllen was underwater for a while uh, after those heavy events. So it's difficult to say, uh, yeah, we'll be great. No, I, I firmly believe with the improvements that we have ongoing and what we've done the last three years on the district's behalf, I believe we, we're better off. And that's why we're very assertive in our approach and. Uh, and, and the work that we're doing right now at the drainage district uh, to, to try to uh, be able to manage that, that water better. So, Yvette? I don't think you'll get um, an engineer working for an entity say that um, any drainage improvements we do will save you from a hurricane or, or an event of that significance. Um, it, they're, the events are, say, difficult to predict where the water falls is difficult to predict, and so all that plays into how your drainage system uh, works. We could receive um, some rain that's coming um, upstream from us that could impact our community, even though we don't have rain in our community. We could have rain in our community, and it, we impact downstream from us. So the, the improvements that we make are improvements to address those more standard uh, rain events that we receive. Our drainage systems um, for our ditches handle approximately a 25-year event. And so when you're looking at a 100-year or, or a hurricane event, um, our systems are not designed for that capacity. We're going to go back and looking um, the way that cities were set up and created, and, and Raul's exactly correct. Um, we're very flat. And so we did not have, um, there's significant areas in, in the county, um, that don't have um, infrastructure to draw water away from those areas. And so what we're doing, um, if the drainage map that we showed you, basically impacts, and the projects that we've installed, basically impacts those older areas of town where there wasn't drainage infrastructure installed. As um, we have progressed, um, we have increased our requirements for drainage. We have increased our requirements for detention. So now we require properties that come into the city um, when they develop to detain for the 50-year event, release for a 10-year and detain on site for a 50-year event. And so our, our requirements have become more stringent because we're aware that these events um, are more probable to happen. It seems um, the rain patterns that we have had um, have recently been of uh, shorter duration but higher intensity. And so um, we built systems that um, can take those rain events that we've received, but for hurricane, um, there's, there will be certain areas that will receive um, or will be inundated. Which areas would those be? Because I don't want to move there. <laughs> well, like I said, it, it's really, it's, let me say, it, it's hard to predict. It really depends where that rain hit. Um, we're looking at time and we're looking at the amount or volume of water that falls. I want to come back to floodplains and flood rating because I just paid my flood insurance to FEMA for my house. Uh, this is for Andrew Cannon. The, the county loop, uh, will it be told? And then what about State Highway 68, the one that the Highway Department had a hearing on last week, was it? It would go from, I think it's the Far Bridge, the thinking is Far Bridge north of 281 for truck traffic. Uh, that's supposed to be told too, so can you address those? 
Um, right now, State Highway 68 goes from uh, Interstate 2 at the Valverde area north, curves back around in uh, Edinburgh to I-69C. It, it is uh, uh, slated at this moment to be a toll road facility. Uh, need to find a way to be able to pay for it, and that's one tool in which they have to be able to leverage those funds to go back to it. Uh, there are free access roads being built in the plan as a part of that, frontage roads. So there will be a free facility to that as well. Uh, as far as the county loop, um, I, I know at one time they had talked about that all being a, a loop project, but we know that the RMA has projects that are underway now that are free uh, portions, and uh, those are part of the county loop, so I, I, I couldn't say that the entire loop system would be po uh, told by any means. Is your organization, the MPO, involved in Highway 68, or is that strictly a... a no, it, it, we're involved with that. Uh, we, we were fortunate enough to work with Representative Martinez uh, Armando, and uh, to receive the funding for that, we got about $88 million from the state, and that has to go through the MPO for the planning process in coordination with TxDOT. $55 million of that was for construction uh, from Monte Cristo down to uh, Interstate 2 for the first phase of the frontage roads. We're hoping, uh, working with TxDOT to include uh, the overpasses at the major arteries where we'll need that, so that way we can do that now. They'll, they'll be cheaper to be able to incorporate now than in a couple of years. And the other remaining 30 million was to make sure that all of the environmental for the entire uh, project was done at one time so that could all be taken care of now. So uh, yeah, all the funding for that and the planning came uh, on that end came through in partnership with TxDOT through our board. Okay. Got a question for Patricia and then one for, um, one for Yvette. Talk about the um, guy, somebody wrote this question saying, talk about the coordination of stoplights to facilitate traffic flow, i.e., can a car in motion stay in motion? So that's what the comprehensive traffic study is trying to accomplish. We're trying to uh, build, of course, the model, and that'll help us create the progression. Now, we won't be able, you won't be able to start at one end of McAllen and go all the way through. We do have, like, east and west, north and south. You'll have to stop here and there. But we're trying to get you through efficiently, and building this model will allow us to do so and getting the modern counts, today's counts. There, is there any thinking, and I guess this is a city commission decision, to take, um, pick an east-west road and to greatly improve it, take it from two lanes, four lanes to eight lanes or something, or to double stack it or something like that. Is there any thinking about that, maybe even further out, that you're aware of? I'm going to. I got a question. Are you talking about for traffic movement, Davis? Yeah. Um, well, the problem with that, and I, I want to share something, is, is, and people don't think about it much, what Patricia was talking about with the coordination of signals is what's most important. When you, when you take a two-lane road, and if it's got 20 vehicles at it sitting at a light and you widen it to four lanes, it still has 20 vehicles in it. It's just that they're spread out across four lanes. With what they're doing, they're implementing greater synchronization along those signals in a corridor, corridor so you can move those 20 vehicles through there succinctly yeah. and make some progress with it. Widening some roadways for added capacity in some areas just doesn't make any sense, and that's part of the process that we go through in the partnerships with the city or with the county, depending on where the project is. Because again, you, you could have 20 at two or you could have 20 at four lanes. If the lights aren't working properly and you don't have that synchronization through the corridor, you're not gonna move any more traffic than you would just by widening the roadway. If, the, if you get the $3 million, how, do you know how fast people could drive on these thor major thoroughfares, the designated crosstown traffic thoroughfares at what rate of speed? Well, you can only go as fast as the speed limit. <laughs> 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 what would that speed limit be, Yvette? Well, it varies for each roadway. That there, uh -huh. there are actually you know studies that are out there. They do change it more there. than you would think. They do. We we proactively go out and uh, take volume counts, speed counts, and so there is a study that's behind that so that we can get that better progression. And um, you know the the signals are timed to follow the speed limits, and we recommend you follow the speed limits. But yeah, that there. I mean, it, there's a, a science behind how those speed limits are established. 
Patricia want to join in? No. You actually will not get through a signal if you're not at the speed limit. So if there's someone in front of you going five, ten miles below the speed limit, now they've pushed you back to the next to the next uh, cycle. So um, I see a tendency of people driving slower to kind of control the speed in the roadway. If you're not going the free flow speed or the 85th percentile speed, you will get caught at every single red light. Uh, for Yvette, there was a drainage ditch that ran north and south, just west of Doctors Hospital and Renaissance at, at Dove and McCall. Um, why did you let them cover up the retention pond? <laughs> I'm, I'm reading the question. And if she, if she doesn't get it here, she's going to get it every other place she goes. So. I've gotten it at every presentation I've been at. <laughs> So, um, no, it, it's a serious question, um, and it's not a decision that I made um, alone. It's not ultimately up to me to make that decision. So the city was approached with a request um, to uh, convert that drain ditch into an underground pipe. Uh, we met with the city of Edinburgh and the developer of that site, um, and we asked them to complete um, a drainage study to confirm that the impact of placing that ditch underground would not negatively impact the surrounding area. They hired an engineer who uh, completed a study, and they actually hired another engineer after that who completed another study. We reviewed the study, we reviewed their hydraulics, or H&H, &H, and we were able to concur that um, based on the improvements that they were making, that there would not be a negative impact to the surrounding area. Part of, uh, part of this is that uh, the, that portion was covered and put underground, but further to the north and east, they also over-excavated to compensate for some of the volume. So um, there were various, um, so a couple of things that were done to mitigate, such as that additional excavation. That brings up a question for Mr. Sessine. It, I, I don't know what the state of, Mac McAllen can have the best pipes in the world, or, or ditches or whatever, but if it, if it chokes down, as you'll hear people say, it chokes down at the city, and you talked about having to hold water back before you let it go. Is, is the, does the county system accommodate the improvements McAllen's gonna make in moving water out of here if it passes? Uh, yes. Um, they can only release what currently um, is connecting to our system, and, and basically everything has to back up. They're not going to improve. They're they're not going to improve any connections into the system to dump more water and what they're releasing. What she's talking about right now, actually, Yvette was mentioning there on McCall Road. East of McCall is where our system starts. West of McCall is where they did the detention facility and so forth. Over excavated for the volume and everything, but that connection is still the same size. So you're just going to back up more water into the McAllen system. And I'm sure that's why they're looking, that's why they over-excavated, that's why they look at detention facilities to make sure they hold water back and release it at the existing rate that it's already been released into our system. Why can't the county open, open the, um, take more capacity? We have to tax everybody. No, no, <laughs> no more taxes. That's my next question. No, no, the, what we would have to do is, is seriously, we, we'd have to improve our downstream uh, uh, system. The Renville drain will help with that uh, once that's in place. Once our system is fully in place, then those chokes can be released and more water can be sent downstream. We have to manage the water that we currently get from upstream systems downstream because uh, if not, we wouldn't be able to accommodate what's downstream either and we would impact downstream areas. So we have to manage the water uh, currently within the system we have, and once that system is expanded, then some of those chokes could be uh, removed. But it's all, it would have to be studied and evaluated and, and, and everything would have to balance out before we removed any chokes. Can I add to that? Um, the master drainage uh, plan that, that we have uh, prepared, um, some of those projects being part of, part of this bond, um, are a variety of projects. Hello? Okay. Some of them are within existing subdivisions, as I mentioned, um, and we're extending uh, drainage lines to them. But we're also making improvements uh, to our existing drain ditches. So we're widening ditches uh, for additional volume, additional capacity. We're building additional um, detention facilities, similar to the existing detention facilities that we have. And so it's not just um, dumping additional water into the system. We're also looking at additional uh, capacity to, to hold that water. 
or Andrew Cannon, if your funding comes from gasoline sales, what other ways can you be funded? What about the thousands of trucks crossing the border into the U.S.? <laughs> if, well, they're talking about greater fuel efficiency uh, over, over time. Um, I was behind a Tesla today coming over here. Uh, so wh where, where do you get your money? Gas tax. That's it. A federal um, or state? Gas tax. Both. Uh, something, I mean, I don't, I don't think most people think about it, is that our gas tax system we have now, uh, our federal gas tax hasn't been raised since 1991, is the last time it's gone up. Completely inappropriate. Uh, the other thing people don't think about is that as CAFE standards rise, or MPG, the fuel tax becomes a sliding scale. So if you have a truck that you're driving now, like I have a Jeep that gets, I'm lucky if I get 14 miles a gallon out of my Jeep driving down the highway. If I trade that in for a Prius and then I'm getting a vehicle that's getting 40 miles a gallon, the exact same number of vehicles are on the roadway putting the same amount of wear or tear on the roadway, but I'm going to the pump one fourth of the time that I was previously. That's not by any means fair to the system and the money that's needed to be able to take care of the network and the infrastructure that's there. So the federal government is looking at some things. The highway trust fund is not completely solvent. They're looking at ways to try to do that. And there been some uh, trials uh, up in the Northwest, uh, Portland uh, area, Washington State, uh, with uh, vehicle miles traveled, which would essentially have people paying a, uh, a pro rata share to the number of miles that you drive on an annual basis um, instead of a fuel tax, which for some people, that works out fantastic because it works you, great in Portland. Well, sure. If you have some people that aren't driving cars on the roadways, they're attributing to what they're driving. If you have people who own a freight company and they're driving 18 wheelers and they have a fleet, then they're paying more because they're putting more wear and tear on the roadway network. So yeah. there's no simple system, no simple answer to it. Um, and I know it's really unfavorable and it's not. Uh, um, it, it's a bad word, but I, I wish they would raise the federal fuel tax to be uh, indexed to what it is with inflationary rates. Because since 1991, the cost of building roadways have gone up a lot more. We have more population. We have more vehicles on the roadways. But the amount of revenue coming in to take care of that uh, hasn't kept up. Interesting little fact for you. Anybody in the room who goes to Starbucks, if you go to Starbucks twice in a month, you're spending more money at Starbucks than you are in federal tax dollars that go to the roadway network, period. It's just that simple. There, there, so, was, a, there was a blue ribbon panel that Perry, uh, Governor Perry, asked to look at roads and how to fund them and stuff, and they came back. They, a lot of these guys were his supporters, his donors. Right. And you need to raise the state gasoline tax, and it didn't go anywhere. So. Yeah. No, it, it, it's a hard one to get out there. Last question, because uh, we're almost out of time. Mr. Sassin, you're a certified floodplain manager. Um, as I understand it, the federal government through FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, looks at the county all over and says, well, this, this area is likely to flood, and this one's more likely to flood, and they rate them. And your, your home insurance is affected by that, I think. Your, your insurance is affected by it. And if you're in a super floody area, then your uh, flood insurance is really expensive, and it's not. If you're not, are we appropriately rated here or are we an accident waiting to happen? A lot of the people in Houston did not have flood insurance. Right. Um, yes, the, the FEMA maps, the firm maps, uh, have areas designated as flood zone, anything with an A. In school, A's were good, very good. I didn't get many, but they were good. Uh, but it, in FEMA maps, A's are not good. Anything with an AH, AO, AE, uh, it's flood zone. So if you live within those areas, uh, any financial institution that if you're borrowing money, you have to get flood insurance. If not, they won't, let, they won't lend you money. Um, so our maps are, are not up to date in some areas. There was some revisions that were done uh, maybe 15 years ago, I believe it was, something like that. Um, we're working now with FEMA. What, one of the issues um, that we're gonna be working on are actively pursuing is the certification or excuse me accreditation of the levies uh, the levies were were improved in our county already uh, they have been certified by the IBWC 
uh, meaning that anything that any water that, that gets diverted uh, it's going to be held in check which it was proven here recently uh, but part of the requirement is uh, that in order for FEMA to, to, to accredit the levies uh, you have to do a landside study which means that any system that comes into the levy from the land side from cities of McAllen, Farr, uh, Donna, all those cities in our systems as well that hit the levies have to be evaluated and have to be accounted for and see what kind of effect that could have on the levy on the land side. Uh, we're working with the FEMA, we're going to work with the Texas Water Development Board uh, to look at that. In order for our maps to be updated, that study has to happen first. Levies have to be accredited and then FEMA will look at updating our maps, uh, which hopefully will re will represent more of a true um, flood risk. Uh, yeah, flood risk because some areas that currently are in flood zones may not be and some areas that um, are in our current maps are not as in a flood zones actually are. So, Well, I applaud all four of you for your patience, if nothing else, to work, to have to sort through all that stuff. It's, that's something. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it.